Climate change is already causing shifts in population patterns around the world, and history has some lessons to offer for climate-driven migrations. So I'm featuring a fantastic journalistic YouTube channel named Critical Dispatch, hosted by Trevor Hayes. Make sure to head over there and subscribe to his channel after this video on climate migrations. My great-grandmother was a Dust Bowl migrant. Her family had a farm in Oklahoma that, after ever worsening crop yields, one day just dried up and blew away in the wind. This left them with little choice but to pack up the family truck and drive west in search of a new life. I remember her telling me stories about how she and her sister had one good dress between them, and they would trade off days on who got to wear the good one, to be fair. I remember her telling me about how they had to spend a few days sleeping in a burned down hotel on the side of the road because they had nowhere else to stay while her dad was looking for work. Lately, I've been thinking about this family history a lot because there's something to be learned about the challenges faced by the Okies who left Oklahoma and drove west. Recent reporting from the Washington Post found that country's climate pledges are built on flawed emissions data that dramatically underreport the scope of the problem. It seems that the international plan to save the world from climate change is built on bad math. So if we assume that large-scale migration is an inevitability at this point, what are policymakers doing and what should they be doing to prepare for this? What can the events of the Dust Bowl migration teach us about the coming climate exodus? During the Dust Bowl migration, migrants who made it to California often faced discrimination, both formalized and informalized. California had felt the effects of the Depression, which already put a strain on the state economy and infrastructure. The state government even passed a law against indigent persons that barred Okies from entry. For those who did cross into California, the Depression, combined with the increase in population, meant that jobs were incredibly hard to come by. People had to regularly move throughout the state, seeking new work, and often following the harvest season from place to place. People who found work often faced brutal economic exploitation that was made possible by the fact that there were so many desperate people looking for jobs. Employers knew they could pay workers next to nothing to work on their farms. There was a lack of affordable and available housing, which meant that many Oki families would end up creating roadside camps near the farms they worked at, which were derogatorily referred to as ditch banks. These camps came with the expected poor sanitary conditions, which caused public health issues. Malnourishment and starvation meant that Okies were extra vulnerable to diseases, one of which was called valley fever, a fungal infection caused by inhalation of dust near agricultural sites. The work they had to beg for, which they could not afford to feed themselves on, was literally killing them. The federal government eventually stepped up and started to build temporary camps for Dust Bowl migrants to live in, but it was decades before these communities became fully integrated. So to recap, the Dust Bowl migrants faced real, structural challenges to their health and well-being, their social acceptance and their livelihoods, and they were coming from within the same country. And this is not an abstract history lesson. We can see this happening now. Farming families in Western Guatemala have been leaving the region in mass. The land simply turned against them. They faced a five-year drought that killed crops and forced families to starve. When it finally did rain, there was massive flooding, which killed whatever crops they could plant. Frequent hurricanes devastated the region. Then the drought returns. These extreme weather patterns are impossible for farmers to predict and move the region out of the realm of reasonable human habitability. These circumstances drove hundreds of thousands of Guatemalans north towards the United States, where they wind up living in camps in Mexico, near the southern border. Many of them face serious malnutrition, disease, and other major health issues. We know that we're facing wide-scale displacement due to rising sea levels, human heat thresholds, and agricultural tipping points. What are the more desirable areas of the country, the climate havens of the future, doing to prepare for this influx of people seeking a new life? Many American cities are already facing a housing crisis. Given the lack of affordable or universal health care, do American cities have the health care capacity to meet the needs of an influx of hundreds of thousands of people? The government is facing an impending crisis that warrants extraordinary measures. The U.S. should immediately prepare and fund a climate refugee resettlement program. This means providing federal resources to increase health care capacity. This means preparing to increase not just temporary housing, but rapidly available long-term housing that's developed in a way that ensures communities can absorb refugees and migrants into their social fabric. Too frequently, crisis housing otherizes migrants. This housing cannot be ditch banks. It cannot be camps built under bridges and on the outskirts of towns. 
This means creating a plan to manage education and other social services under increased strain and building on the lessons of current refugee crises. The country of Jordan already faced this issue when the Syrian refugee crisis brought over half a million Syrians into their country. A large influx of children meant that school infrastructure was simply unprepared to educate all the new children. While the IPCC report made it clear that it's code red for humanity, governments and communities still have time to prepare for moving populations with smart public policy that maintains human dignity to the maximum degree possible. While this might seem like alarmism to some, time might be shorter than you think. So head on over to Critical Dispatch for more videos on public policy and foreign affairs. The link is in the video description and in the comments below.